Okay. Um, last time, I think we were just about finished power, haven't we? And I seem to remember that um, we were talking about power nemoralis and talking about the fact that it's not not the only grass that you get in woods. It's usually around the periphery of woods, and it's mainly uh, um, uh, <coughs> other species in 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 the, in the centre. Um, and uh, I remember Jonathan shouting the. Uh, Hail Hitler when we got to that one, pointing out that the, the leaves are normally at right angles to, to the stem. Um, one that I didn't show last time was Power Angustifolia, and I think a lot of people are overlooking this. It occurs at the same time as Power Pretensis early in the spring. And so if you've, if you've got a, um, a, a rather large power about this high, uh, and it hasn't got a long, a long ligule, it's probably Parangoscifolia. So go down the bottom and see if it looks like the Stuka Ruba, because it's very common on verges and people are overlooking it. <clears throat> it's a yeah, it loves, loves chalk grassland. Sorry? It loves chalk grassland. Yes, it, it does, yes. Uh, chalk pits, particularly yeah. uh, chalk pits down at Grays, yeah. And in Power Compressor, uh, not much of it on walls these days, but it's very common on concrete, particularly um, agricultural concrete, where you've got cracks in the concrete. That's the place to look for it now. And if you have any difficulty with identification, the comb is flat right up to the top. It's flattened all the way up. And it's very sort of stiff, very stiff and crispy. Mm -hmm. And then the other one people are overlooking is power humulus, which tends to persist very late. And we're finding it mainly on a marine alluvium, um, coastal uh, grasslands that have been in from the sea. It's what it's a it's a it's a co-dominant plant, and it only grows normally about that high. It looks a bit like power annual, but they're very very chunky, mm -hmm. and the glooms uh, are very very pointed. But once you get your eye in for it, you can see it from several feet away and say that's power humulus. Yes. It also grows along. Uh, uh, in very dry habitats on the edge of verges. There's a lot of it on black heath in North Kent. In, yeah, in, um, just Northern just just right. yes behind the just behind the um, curb stones usually because it has very fine very fine rhizomes. Uh, <clears throat> um, and the others we we hadn't considered were the uh, those generally that are related to power. <laughs> We've got Glyceria, which has cylindrical sheaths, and Paxinalia and Power have got wrapped sheaths, and Paxinalia lemmas are rounded on the back. So if you've got something you're not sure it's a Power or a Paxinalia, it's a question whether it's rounded on the back or whether it's keeled. Mm -hmm. And I've produced this little chart here to help people identify the Paxinalias with the main, main sort of size characters. That's available on the website. I had hoped to bring some printed copies of these, my printer packed up last week, so I haven't been able to print anything. Um, the one that, these two people get confused, the <laughs> spikelets are much larger in Meritima, so measure your spikelets if you want to separate the two. The problem is that Meritima, when it gets old, it gets reflexed. Mm -hmm. So if it's reflexed, don't assume it's distans, it might well be, and probably is Meritima. Then the other two, of course, are, are much rarer, Fasciculator, we've got mainly Suffolk and Essex and uh, Rupestris. <clears throat> um, so uh, you need you need to measure the measure the uh, the blooms and the lemmas for those to be absolutely sure if you're not familiar with them. <clears throat> Fasciculata is very common uh, on the east coast um, on bare mud uh, on uh, tops of sea walls and. Uh, on the um, uh, on the berms at the back of the sea walls, uh, Rupestris is very very like catapodium. It's very like fern grass. It's a very uh, gelatinous sort of thing. And <laughs> hordiums. I think we went through the hordiums, did we not? Yeah. Um, yeah. The hordiums. Uh, well, I, I dealt with in. Uh, that's his botany 13. So if you've got one of those, it's got, it's got all the hordiums in. Uh, I think the people have great difficulty in distinguishing the bits. Uh, you, you, you need to distinguish these three uh, florets because 
uh, people tend to record uh, murinum uh, as when they see it, they will tell that's just murinum. But look very carefully, because it may not be murinum. There is the, this, other, this other form, which has the two outer spikelets fertile and the center one um, less developed and either male or sterile. And it's not called murinum because it's uh, all barley. It's because it's mousy. It's got mousy hairs. So look at it under a lens. If it's got long hairs like that, it's murinum and it's not one of the others. <laughs> and then we have um, secolinum, no hairs, um, marinum, no hairs, and geniculatum, which is beginning to come in now, Mediterranean barley. We've got some records for Essex now. Uh, um, if you want to distinguish secolinum from marinum, have a look at the upper uh, gloom. <coughs> There's a pair of glooms, I'll put them in brown. The upper gloom is flattened and quite wide, about a millimeter and a half wide. Uh, in the canopogenicolatum, uh, both the glooms, uh, the outer glooms, are, are thickened, but not quite so much as in marinum. So look out for those because they are around and they're being overlooked. There's an enlargement of uh, marinum and secolina. Uh, and you can look at them from the other side. The important thing in many cases is to look for the rachilla extension. This is the little stalk that's left where the, the spike lid above has been suppressed. Because there's another one, glaucum, which is coming in. And that has orange um, rachilla extensions. They really are bright orange. That's the summary which I put in the in essence part of me. There we are. That's that's the the uh, rachilla extensions on glaucum. So just pull the triplet off. Look on the back for the rachilla extensions, and if they're orange, it's probably glaucum, and it tends to be a bitish, bit bluish green anyway. Right, uh, fescues. I've done a general one for sort of general teaching for the common common different types of fescues, snorises and the uh, and the fescue gravinos and so on. Um, if you want that for teaching, you can download that one. And that's some of Clive Stacey's drawings, and I've added to them there to separate the two groups where the um, the, uh, the tillers uh, can either penetrate through the sheath, make a hole through it, which is quite easy to see if you look at the base, or they come up inside a sheath. You can separate the two groups, mm -hmm. the Ovina group and the Ruka group. <laughs> I think most of you know about that. This is essentially what's happening. That one's going right the way through that sheath for that leaf. This one's coming up the inside of it. Now, vulpures, uh, I've made this table out for people with vulpures. Uh, if you look at the shape of the glooms, uh, sorry. Uh, yes, if you look at the shape of the glooms and the number of nerves and the relative length of the upper and lower blooms. You can do them fairly simply like that. Uh, this one I produce for, if you're taking students out to the seaside and they want to look at grasses, that's just the general of grasses, which uh, are likely to come across. And here are some of the maritime grasses. <coughs> I'll deal with Spartina in a minute. Uh, this is how to identify the Spartinas. These are all still available on the, on the coast. Townsendii is still there, um, and Altoni Flora. There's some stuff that's been planted, and they're still surviving in small colonies if you look for them. I put this one on for this juncia, the uh, um, sand cooch. Uh, really beautiful if you look at it under a lens. It's got these lovely spines all along the nerves. That's an easy way of identifying that. Right, the Spartinas, this, the story goes around that Spartina Maritima is being ousted by Anglica. It isn't, because they grow in different places. Maritima grows at the top of the beach, uh, it tend to be on flat mud, and very often, and where you've got a, salt, a little salt pan, it'll grow around the edge of the salt pan. And people overlook it because the leaves are very dark green. They don't stand out. Uh, even when they're in flower, they don't stand out very well. Um, but the flowers are, the, the inflorescences are much smaller, leaves are much darker, and there are obvious characters to separate them. In Anglica, the stamens are almost exactly a centimetre long, 
whereas in Marissima, they're only five millimeters. So that's an easy distinction. The other distinction is if you look, if you're not in flower, uh, Anglica has got these very long fibers. It's a bit like, um, uh, it's a bit like the reeds with, with its fibrous uh, um, <laughs> ligule. And they're a couple of millimeters long, whereas in Spartina, you can hardly see them about half a millimeter. And then, as I say, uh, you can still pick up the others. And I've made out the characters there. That's in um, in this latest Essex Botany, the 14, which uh, most of you haven't got yet, but there's a pile of them on the back there. It wasn't ready last year. Um, uh, and it, you remember I did Agrostis and uh, Bromes last time. Well, that's now in this. The, those are all in this one now. So if you haven't got them, you can pick them off the bench there. It's number 14. <clears throat> What's new? How long have we got? Five minutes. Five minutes, right. What's new? Right. Well, remember we had the sand mats. Uh, what was it? Quite a few back now. I had the time flies, doesn't it? Frightening. Sand, number 10. Well, we found a new sand mat uh, last year. This is um, Euphorbia davidii, which grows about that high. And we found it in uh, a game crop among maize so that's something that you may well find it belongs to the poinsettia group of the euphorbia uh it doesn't have like the sand mats here we just go back and we can see the, the sand mats have these little extra petal like structures uh around the um nectaries uh and they act as flowers which are, attract ants and the ants uh, the ants collect the nectar and they also collect the seeds because some, in some cases the seeds actually ooze a mucilage. When they get wet, they ooze a mucilage, and the ants collect those and take them down to their middens. So it's probably going to be several of these. There's several of these spreading around the world. So look out for little euphorbias in uh, in game crop um, plantations. We've got ceteria and, and and things like that, uh, and they have these little little nectaries like. Um, you remember those cough sweets you used to have, the chewy ones with a little slot in the top? I can't remember what they're called now. Um, but they look exactly like those, and they're, they're like little horns. Um, <clears throat> they don't bother to have any other attracting structures. They just have these naturalists. Too. Now, something completely new. Have you heard uh, about um, the Google project to map habitats of the world? What they done, what they do is there's a satellite going round and it takes 5,000 photographs of the world every day. And it, it uh, covers uh, at a, a 10 meter resolution. <clears throat> and using deep learning, they have trained an algorithm to recognize the textures and the spectra of habitats. <clears throat> and they've actually produced habitat maps for the entire world. This is the area that we're mapping at the moment. We're, this is a, an MOD site of 40 one kilometer squares. And it's pretty accurate, actually. And it classifies like that. And they've done that for the whole world and it's repeated every five days. So you can actually go back in time. The only trouble is when you switch it on, it's freely available. When you switch it on, it starts off in the United States. So you have to zoom in and go right across the Atlantic and find Europe. <laughs> But it's it's fun to play with, so have a go at it. So I've, in in the new Essex Botany, I'll give you how, tell you how to get onto it. But if you go uh, dynamic dynamic world, that's all we need to do. Just Google dynamic world, and you can get onto it. Right, gradient Parisienne, Parisienne C. Uh, we had this at Clacton uh, a, f a few years ago in a cemetery. Vast quantities of it uh, in an area which strimmed. And I took some photographs of it, and it was obviously uh, the Leo Carpen one, the one that's supposed to be in this country, with little pimples all over the fruits. Uh, but uh, last year, uh, I was out with Laura, and we found some on uh, Candy Island. And this is, this is pictures from Belgian ones. There's our one, that's one of Laura's pictures. It's got spiny fruit. See the fruit's just developing. This is Par Parisiense var Parisiense, which is found in, in as a, uh, an adventure in America, and it's now and it's found around the Mediterranean. And uh, we've found two sites within a few days of each other. So have a look at your uh, 
um, Gailey and Parisiense. There were about 200 records up to 2000, and then it suddenly mushrooms. Um, so have a look at them because you may have got this one. The reason they may have been mushroom, numbers may be mushrooming, is could well be because um, it's this variety rather than the one we've had before. Yeah, and that, that's and that looked like Gallium Murali. Sorry? That looked like Gallium Murali. Parisiense. No, it looks like Murali, that last one. The last one? Because of the, the length of the, the fruit. We Instead of it being round. Oh, it wasn't fully developed. It wasn't fully developed, that one. <laughs> uh, the other thing we found is um, this, this clover. Um, what's it called now? Ah, oh. hold on. Yes, it's tri it's Trifolium hybridum subspecies elegans. It used to be called Trifolium elegans. These beautiful pink flowers. There's only about. Uh, 150 records for the UK, and we found it um, down near Rayleigh uh, this year. Uh, it's very different from ordinary hybridum. It's prostrate. Uh, it's got very small leaves, and yet the leaves are only half the size of uh, subspecies hybridum, but it's got twice the number of veins. So <clears throat> look out for that. Um, it turned out that the site we found was only one and a half miles from a site that uh, Job Lousley had found it in the 1940s. <clears throat> the other thing I've been doing is looking at the possibility of determining distributions from uh, temperature isotherms. See if we can find out uh, what the limits are for certain species. And um, there's some very useful old. Uh, transparencies that were produced by uh, for um, by uh, the record centre for the new atlases. They're quite big ones, but of course the atlases, when the plant atlases came out, they came much smaller pictures. But they're still very useful because most of the plants that are around today will have adapted to temperatures, say, 50, 100 years ago or before that. So it's very useful to look for those. So it's another thing we've been looking at. You hey, can try and correlate things with, with temperature. Hey, have you drawn those on, or is there a digital uh, resource there? There is a physical resource, yes. Yeah, I've copied them in the in the next test right. Yeah, I've drawn those on to, 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 just for easiness. Um, and a similar sort of problem came up with f f uh, Fumaria capulata. Um, we've only got it on the Tendering Peninsula. We occasionally get it elsewhere, but it doesn't survive. And I thought, why is it just there? But if you look at the, not the mean temperatures, mean January temperatures or the mean July temperatures, but the lowest temperature that you should get, all the inland ones are very, very close to freezing. Whereas the tendering peninsula is virtually surrounded by the sea and you're getting much higher temperatures, getting sort of uh, at least 0 0.1 or 0.2 above. So uh, that looks like the, the controlling factor. So it's the it's the, the lowest temperature that it goes to in the winter time. So we've been trying to do one or two things like that. Um, and what's now available, uh, there's a, a satellite. Uh, I can't remember the name of the flipping thing. <laughs> um, there's a satellite which it, it has a, a thermal imager, which takes the temperature of the Earth every day. And it, uh, it has a resolution of uh, a relative that's 10 meters i think this one is as well as the, the other one and um yes it's lands lands eight mm. and it, <laughs> it's been producing data for quite a long time and you can see that the built-up areas of southwest Essex and london are at higher temperature to higher average temperature than the uh, intermediate areas and if you go into the countryside you find that areas like epping forest and the uh, the reservoirs in the Lee Valley are actually a lower average temperature than, say, agricultural land. So that's that's obviously factors which uh, can affect distribution of things, and particularly of a lot of towns now, um, big towns. I mean, we've got two hundred thousand new houses in North Essex in the last ten years. Uh, 
towns are moving outwards with their heat islands, and these are going to affect the distribution of things. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, this, this is the this is the last thing that's in there. You'll enjoy reading. You'll enjoy reading that. Uh, it's been calculated that if everybody. Everybody in the world planted a tree, it will eight million of us. It would offset our carbon footprint by 34 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and now, have you heard about the LIDAR, LIDAR scanning of, uh, of trees? Google are now participating in this. Um, the guys in America are trying to make these driverless cars, right? And they keep crashing into things. So they've been developing LIDAR uh, algorithms uh, to prevent the cars crashing and they're having to vary the wavelengths because it's at the dampness of the air effects. So they've got very sophisticated programs now to, so these cars can go around. Now, people are using these now to map trees. This is, this is uh, um, Wytham, Witham Wood at, uh, near Oxford and they have scanned it 2.6 centimetre layers like that and you can reconstruct the trees that's a sycamore tree that's been reconstructed in three dimensions. You can have the length of the total length of the branches, including all the twigs, is 10,000 meters. <laughs> and so what you can do is, you know, you know what proportion of, of carbon there is in wood. You can work out how much carbon is actually stored in all the world's trees. And Google is now doing this for the entire Earth. And they now know how many trees there are on Earth because they've scanned the whole lot every day. It's got to, it's a question of getting the AI um, deep learning algorithms to handle it all because it's masses and masses of data as you can imagine. But it's frightening when you come to think of it. <laughs> right, and that's all the trees for Witham Wood laid out. <laughs> <laughs> Is that available as a T-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it identifies them as well. It identifies them as well. Um, and that's with the leaves stripped off, but it actually does the leaves. And of course, one third of the trees are underground. We don't know how, what the volume of those is. <laughs> that's the end of that. <laughs> Finally, I'm just going to, one minute, one minute. Um, so we've already had talks on fungi. Well, my excuse of talking about this particular fungus, because I, I came in this morning and saw all those bottles out there this morning. So I'm sure you're all interested in this particular one. This is, uh, this is baker's yeast. Now, baker's yeast lives in, in the wild. It's, it's, it's actually an ascomycete. It was a cup fungus for 40,000 years ago, but it's given up being a cup fungus and it's gone down to a single cell and it lives in nice, in nice uh, sugary uh, nectar or rotting fruits and things like that. The trouble is it has two genetic strains, A and alpha. And if the fruit flies just put one spore on to some nectar, produces a population, it's had it when the nectar runs out. So what some of them have actually done is they found out how to change their sex. So the mother can mate with one of the daughters and produce a spore, and then they're laughing, they can go to another, another one. Well, that gave me a clue as how to work out the three-dimensional structure of the chromosome, because nobody has worked out the structure of any chromosomes, not even, not even bacteria. Nobody knows what the three-dimensional structure of the chromosome is. And the reason is it's known that in order to change its sex, it has to cut that bit of DNA there and it has to go across to here and join there. And then it can copy the, copy the other genes. And it can only go to the right. If you have a, if you have a coil, it can be left-handed or right-handed. Nobody knew before this that one strain is left-handed and one strain is right-handed. And there's models of them. <laughs> these are nucleosomes, these are the little bobbins that the, uh, the DNA is wrapped around, They're able to work out exactly where the DNA is around each one. And there's the bridge coming across, there it is. It cuts it, there's even a little hinge comes up to lift it up and then it finds its target at the other end. And there's an enlargement here, I think it's the same. Whoops. That's the three dimensional structure matching a little target down here how it does it and from that I was able to go backwards both ways and work out the, the exact sequence around all the all the bobbins all the nucleosomes so uh, I had uh, 
kidney cancer and I was afraid I was going to snuff it because I had difficulty to get an operation. So I thought I better get this published. So instead of going to uh, a publisher and waiting months to get it sorted out, I decided to print the thing. So I've got 300 copies and I've now got to distribute them and, and publicize people. So if you want one, they're 15 quid and it's a detective story. The first half is just a detective story starting in 1992 when the sequence came out. Okay, that's it. Right. <laughs>